This isn't a picture of me, but it could be. It's what I was doing a number of years ago. Um, I'm a veterinary surgeon, and I worked for many years in farm work. And so what I did was basically spend a lot of time delivering cattle, sheep, and pigs. As you can see, it's pretty basic. This is your classic carving in the middle of a field. Um, and you have to make a decision very quickly, basically. You have to decide if you can physically help, if you can give a medicine to make the womb or the uterus contract a bit harder, or do you do a cesarean section? I'm going to use the term uterus throughout, which is the same as the womb. And I just want to point out that it's, this is the organ that looks after the baby or the calf throughout gestation, but it's largely made up of muscle. And it's this muscle contracting at the end of gestation, actually when the baby or the calf's born, that actually does a lot to push it out. So then a few years later, I had my own children, three beautiful boys. I actually had them over the, over the water in Arrow Park Hospital. And when you, when you have a baby, you have it in a delivery room a little bit like this a lot of the time. Much, much more high-tech, of course. Lots of equipment, because babies are very, very precious to check how the baby's doing. But if you stop and think about it, ultimately, if you're having problems delivering a baby, this is all your doctor can do. They can physically help, in this case, usually with forceps or ventouse. They can give a medicine to make your uterus contract a bit harder to help push the baby out, or they do a cesarean section. At this point in time, I do research into the uterus, specifically the muscle in the uterus, but also other aspects to do with childbirth. I'm doing this job now because of how important I think it is. I mean, I think Selena pointed out earlier today, you don't have to be a woman to be interested in childbirth. Every single person here was a product of childbirth, and your life chances to a certain degree depended and almost on that, that very short journey you made. So childbirth is really important to all of us. But I think it's also sobering just to stop for this minute in the afternoon and think that while we've listened to these amazing talks today, 400 women have died through childbirth directly as a result of childbirth around the world. It causes masses amounts of, 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 of loss of women and babies. So I think a really good place to start is the cesarean section. The cesarean section is a wonderful operation. When I was pregnant, it was incredibly reassuring to know that should I get into difficulties, I could have a cesarean section. It wasn't like 100 years ago, and it's not like sub-Saharan Africa now. When, you, know, you could have unimaginable pain and agonies for days and days and possibly die at the end of that. Cesarean sections are great, and I'm not knocking them at all. But I think like Selena, maybe I want to go on a bit more from that, is to discuss this graph up in the right-hand corner, and that is the growing cesarean rate. At the Women's Hospital at the moment, which is pretty reflective of the rest of the UK, you have a one in four chance of delivering your baby by caesarean section. And I want to know the reason why. Of course, the papers know why. We're all a bit too posh to push. But like a lot that's written in the papers at the moment, it's completely rubbish and we can show it's completely rubbish. 50% of the women that are having caesareans are already in labour. They're actually already trying to give birth normally, if you like. And of the other 50%, we see the reasons they're having caesarean sections. In nearly all cases, they're medically advised to do so. So it's absolutely nothing to do with too posh to push. But if it's not that reason, then what is it? There's not time to go through all the many varied reasons here, but I want to touch on two or three. The first is that we know that if you are very overweight, you are much more likely to have problems during childbirth. You are much more likely to end up having a caesarean section, maybe twice as, twice as likely. We also know that of the women who are in labour that need to have a caesarean section, 50% of them have that caesarean because the uterus is not just able to contract hard enough. The diagnosis is poor uterine contractions. So that is a significant problem at the moment. And then I want to look briefly at the alternatives. I used to carry a block and tackle in my car when I was working as a vet, and I was very relieved to find they don't have block and tackles in delivery rooms. But, and that's because babies are quite fragile, and there is a limit to what physically you can do. So I don't want to talk much more about that at the moment. But I do want to talk a little bit about what medicines are available. This is the Bible for most doctors and medical professionals. I've got a slightly older copy here. It's called the British National Formula. It lists every single medicine that's available. If I was a heart doctor, a cardiologist, it's about 70 pages in here, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of medicines. 
but I wouldn't have to carry the book around if I was an obstetrician working at the Liverpool Women's Hospital. Page 425, ripped out, popped in my back pocket. We have one medicine that we can treat poor uterine contractions with to augment uterine contractions, and it's called oxytocin. And it was developed by this man, Vincent de Vigno, and he got the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for it. It was a really big finding. But I think it's very sobering to think, I don't know how many people are watching this new series on the BBC at the moment called The Midwife. 1950s is when he developed it. And there has been nothing, nothing ever since. We have one product to help stimulate uterine contractions, which is responsible for half of the cesareans of women in labour. And if you stop and think why, which I do often, I can think of several reasons, but the, the one I keep coming up with is the cesarean section itself. It is a fairly straightforward operation. It's not a small operation, but it's fairly straightforward, and it's safe in the West. It's not safe or appropriate in lots of parts of the world, but it's safe in the West. And I sort of think it gives, it's given, tradition, it's given doctors a bit of a get, a jail, get out of jail card, isn't it? Um, you know, they know that they ultimately they can get the baby out with a cesarean section. And I do wonder if heart transplants were as easy as cesarean sections, whether it'd have all these hundreds of sort of other alternative medicines. So what I'd like to do now is address the other two problems, at least briefly, that, that we might want to do. And the first I want to look at is what can we do for people who are very overweight and pregnant? I mean, it's great to say that prevention's better than cure, but ultimately there are going to be a lot of overweight pregnant women. There's a research project going on at the moment. It's going on at the Liverpool Women's Hospital and, and also other centres, and I'm involved with this um, around the country. We know if you're very overweight, you're much more likely to become diabetic. And there's good reason for that, because the way that diabetics and very overweight people control their sugar in their body are quite similar. So what we're doing is having a look at a medicine that we know is safe in pregnancy, and it's given to diabetic women at the moment, and we want to see if it'll help some of the problems, help reduce some of the problems that very overweight women have. The only way, to, it doesn't matter what we think, we need to test this, and the only, only way to actually trial this is to do what we call a blinded, randomised trial. And just briefly to explain this, because it's a very, very important type of trial that goes on in medicine today, and you can see two packets of medicine there. Now, one contains this metformin medicine, and one contains a placebo. You can't tell, can you, which one's which. I don't know, the doctors don't know, the patients don't know. Absolutely nobody knows what they're taking. Obviously, patients who've agreed to take part in the study. And we won't know until all the babies are born. We'll record how straightforward the deliveries were, how big the babies, and all manner of things. And then the person with the key will break that. And what I'm really hoping is the fact that this medicine will make a big difference to, to some of the very overweight ladies we've got. Not so they all take this medicine, but so at least we can offer them something else other than you've got a really good chance of having problems and you'll probably have a caesarean. At least it gives us another choice. Another type of the work I'm doing, and I do it over the road, very close to here, is work in the laboratory. We're really, really lucky in Liverpool in that a lot of women who are going to have a caesarean section actually donate a, a piece of their uterine muscle for science. They're very generous. This is this type of thing we get. I hope there's not too many squeamish people here, but basically we get a small piece of muscle. And what I do here is I actually dissect, you can see in the picture in the bottom, a very small strip of this. And then we put it in a fluid that approximates the, the fluid content of blood. And we attach a sensor to a computer. And the next bit, I think, is almost magic. It's fantastic. In that if we warm this small piece of tissue up to body temperature, it will contract. It contracts spontaneously outside the body. And you get these rises and falls in the form of a graph that represent the contraction and relaxation that don't actually look that dissimilar to the sort of recordings a midwife actually might take in hospital. Now, this, of course, seems a long, long way from the bedside. But if I talk briefly about uh, some work that's done in Liverpool, it has actually made a difference already. One of the obstetricians at the Liverpool Women's Hospital noted that if she was doing a caesarean section because the women had poor uterine contractions and compared them to women who were having caesareans for other reasons, that the acidity of the muscle, the uterine muscle at surgery, was lower. In other words, you had more acid around the, the uterus when the contractions had sort of given up. And this led us to wonder about the effect of acid on muscle contraction. Now, absolutely any movement 
walking, any movement of muscle produces acid. It's the basic byproduct. It's a waste product. And if you're training for the London Olympics or you're going to do a marathon, one of the effects of training is to teach your muscles to actually deal with this acid a little bit better. So we wondered what the effect of acid on the, the uterine muscle would do. And if you look at the bottom left first, you can see a trace very similar to the one I showed you in live action before. You can see the up and downs of the contractions and the relaxations. And what we did is we put oxytocin in this one medicine we have on it to make sure it was contracting really well. And then we put a little bit of acid, just the sort of acid, amount of acid that you would normally see. And I think you can tell from that bottom graph that the muscle stopped contracting immediately. Now, this has been published worldwide in, in, in sort of scientific papers and, and attracted quite a lot of interest. There's a lots and lots of work still to do, but a Swedish company immediately have made a piece of equipment that will actually enable us to monitor acid within the uterus throughout labour. So it's ongoing work that will hopefully give us a better handle on what's going wrong in the labour room. But what I'd also like to talk a bit about is what we're going to be doing in the future. This picture, which I think is fabulous, is taken with a modern microscope, and it's of a similar piece of, of muscle, the sort of muscle I showed you on the pictures before. It's magnified times 200, and we're using a confocal microscope, which gives us a really, really crisp image. What you can see there, I've sort of highlighted in the red, is groups of, of muscle cells within that piece of tissue that I took. What I'm really interested in, because I think it'll help us really understand what's going on, is what happens before the muscle contracts. It's always a good thing in science to go back before, to understand the whole process of what's happening. And specifically what I'm interested in is, is calcium, the iron. You find it in milk you drink. Calcium is very important, isn't it, for your bones and things? Well, it's really important for muscle contraction as well. And so what I've done is put a sensor into this muscle that actually will give off light. It will fluoresce when calcium goes up and down. I'll stop for a minute. Remember, this, 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 this piece of muscle is still alive. And if you wait for a minute, you can see what happens just before it contracts. It's a big flash of life. I'll wait for it to, to, to reel again. But if you look at it, you can just about make out that a fraction of a second before it actually moves, it will actually, the light will come out. And if I show you this graph, this is more or less what's happening. Basically, calcium is shooting up a fraction of a second. It's calcium that's actually causing the muscle cells to contract. And we're now looking into ways that actually we can find things to affect the calcium. Or, for example, oxytocin will, will actually stimulate. One of the ways it works is to make calcium go up in the muscle cells. So that's, those, are, those are sort of techniques we're using. I could have spent the next two hours talking about all the questions that we have, but I'll just run through some of what I think are the most important ones. Why doesn't oxytocin work in some women? That We're always being asked this by clinicians. It's the only medicine available, and it doesn't work in a lot of women. In fact, all the women there end up, nearly always end up having caesareans due to poor contractions. I've already had this, and it hasn't worked. How can we stop the uterus contracting during preterm labour? We haven't got very much on offer there either. And so we're looking for medicines that might do that. Can we find an alternative to oxytocin? I think most people know with painkillers, some work well for one person, some work well for another. It would be really nice to have at least two, two alternatives. And I think a particular passion of mine, thinking of that figure about how many women are dying throughout the world, Really what we could do with is a medicine that we don't need to stick in the fridge, which is the case with oxytocin, that we can just bung in your pocket and can be used to, to, to stimulate the uterus to contract. Because that will help deliver babies in obstructed labours, but it will also help stop women bleeding, which is a, a big cause of, of death over in places like sub-Saharan Africa. So that's just some of the questions. We can think of loads more. And just to put some pretty pictures, but I think quite relevant pictures down there at the bottom, these are all plant products that we actually think are good in some cultures for childbirth. We talk about raspberry leaf tea in the UK, and we talk about pineapples. Well, also in Asia, we talk to people in Asia, and they talk about pomegranates and watermelon. And I must have, at the back of my mind, it's wondering, is there something within those those, those plant products that we haven't yet found that actually does something to stimulate the uterus. So that's some questions for the future and some of the techniques we've got for the future. But one of the great things about standing here in Merseyside is what's happening in Merseyside at the moment. 
And if anybody fancies a really wet walk after this conference, just half a mile up the road, there's a bit of a building site at the Liverpool Women's Hospital at the moment. The Liverpool Women's Hospital is the largest maternity hospital in the whole of Europe. It has the largest IVF, NHS run IVF unit in the whole of the UK. It is a fantastic resource. We've also got Liverpool University over the road, which is a big research-based-led institution. And they're building a new centre at the moment, should be in there this time next year, that's going to be completely devoted to the research of childbirth and associated issues. Research isn't just about buildings, it's the people that you can get into the buildings to sort of discuss with one another all the problems and research them. And we've got, to start off with, we've got Professor Jim Nielsen, who's an obstetrician, particularly interested in twins, who's going to be there, who's at the Women's Hospital at the moment. And Professor Susan Ray, who has an international reputation for researching um, problems of the uterus, particularly the uterine muscle. We're not just going to be interested in some of the problems I've talked today, but also you know, the best practice for health professionals, clinical trials, but also looking at things like recurrent miscarriage, which is a big problem, and IVF, as well as some of the laboratory science that, uh, that I'm doing at the moment that we want to direct to uh, clinical problems. I think overall what I want to get over across is that research isn't the answer to everything. Of course it's not. And I think there were some lovely ideas that came from this morning's talk about how you manage women and look after women around childbirth. But my experience is, is that if you understand a problem, if you understand what's gone wrong, you're in a much better, better place to fix it. And I think that this new um, venture in Liverpool will make it one of the world-leading centres to actually investigate some of these problems. Thank you for listening. <laughs>